Hi there everyone and welcome to Learn A-Level Biology for free with Miss Estrick. This video is a help video in particular for Year 12s who have just done the aseptic technique required practical, just to give you an idea of how you should have planned it, conducted the experiment and how to write it up. So the aim was to complete two experiments, one on inhibition zones where you have this clear ring around the antibiotics to see which has killed the most bacteria and therefore is the most effective. And then also this streak plating technique as a way to be able to identify and isolate individual colonies which could then be used for further research. And across the two plates the aim was to have no contaminations. So first of all, in investigating which antibiotic is most effective, but also for the streak plates, within your method, you had to identify how you were going to maintain a septic technique throughout. And that's one of the things you're assessed on. So aseptic technique means working in sterile conditions, and that's to prevent any contaminations of other microbes on your plate but also to prevent you then leaving the lab and infecting others with the bacteria you were inoculating. So there's three steps, pre-inoculation, which is before you add the bacteria to your plate. Inoculating is whilst you are adding the bacteria and post-inoculation is after. So pre-inoculation, you should have only selected sterile equipment or sterilized metal equipment yourself by putting it in the roaring flame of the Bunsen burner. To sterilize the work surfaces, you need to use a disinfectant and you might have had bright pink Vercon. And you have to wash your hands thoroughly with soap to remove any microbes. During the inoculating of your two plates, you should work near the Bunsen burner the entire time. And the reason for that is because you have that flame there, you get these convection currents drawing the air up into the Bunsen burner. As the air passes through that flame, it kills any microbes in the air and you get this constant current sterilizing the air. Um, also with the petri lid, only open it when necessary and only slightly open it at an angle to reduce the chance of any microbes landing on the agar. So post inoculation is then exactly the same as pre. You then have to sterilize all your equipment again because you've deliberately had it touch an E. coli. Sterilize the work surfaces with disinfectant and wash your hands again. So I've got an equipment list here and at the same time we can have a look at the experiment. So I've washed my hands with soap. Then I'm going to sterilize the surface with Vercon. Get the Bunsen burner onto the roaring flame is the next step. Now everything is sterile, I'm going to label the two Petri dishes first. And it's essential that you do label this at the beginning and you need to label it with your initials, the date you have done this and the contents. And that is so that if the plates um, were found by someone else, they know exactly what is in there and how long it's been growing for, um, and that is a serious safety consideration. So I'm going to do the street plate first. The inoculating loop needs to be at the top of the gas cone, which is the hottest part of the flame, and you can see it's so hot it's going red and sterile. Let the inoculating loop cool down slightly before dipping it in the E. coli. And you notice that I've not put the lid or the open bottle on the bench. Screw the lid on before I put it down. Then working near the Bunsen burner and with the lid um, tilted open, I'm doing my street plate as quickly as possible. Once I'm finished, lid will go on and then sterilize the inoculating loop again to kill the E. coli before I then um, put it onto a surface. Last thing, we need to tape the lid on so that it doesn't fall off. Don't tape it the whole way round though, because you want oxygen to be able to get in. So now for the inhibition zone plate, I'm using a sterile one millimeter syringe, which actually I've realized is not on that list. You would need that in the equipment. Um, again, don't put the bottle down on the table. I'm using 0.7 milliliters, placing that on. Um, the syringe fill up with Vercon to sterilize the inside and out. Then I've got my sterile spreader. 
and I need to make sure that I evenly spread the E. coli all over the surface of the agar because you need a nice even lawn of bacteria to grow. So make sure it gets to all of those um, sides of the circle. And then straight into the Vercon to disinfect it. Next I've got my sterile forceps and four antibiotic discs and we'll use the sterile forceps to pick up the um, discs and then place onto the um, petri dish. Now if you do drop yours, really you should get another one, but the reason I carried on was I was confident that my workspace was completely sterile because I had just sterilised the work surface. I've then made sure it's completely flat. Lastly, take the lid on again. And that's my second plate done. So that's the two plates. The final thing is the post inoculation sterilization. So I need to then disinfect the whole workspace again. Put everything away in the bin and I'm then using my soap and that was actually hand sanitizer to clean the hands. So that is the method. As I pointed out, you should have goggles the whole time um, and I don't have the um, syringe on that list. So next then is you incubate your two plates. And what that means is leave it at a set temperature so that it then has time to grow. And it's about five to 10 days at 25 degrees C, which is warm enough for the bacteria to grow. Um, any hotter than that is not safe in a school environment because you could get excessive growth. So when it comes to the results, with the streak plate, what you were looking for is, did you get any individual colonies, which are these tiny circles? Now, you might have had bigger circles. If you did, well done, because that's what you were aiming to achieve. The whole point of streak plate is you only dip it into the bacteria once, the inoculating loop, and you're spreading it. And then you can clearly see I've then dragged across the first spread, dragged across the third fourth and I've even gone for a fifth and each time you're spreading the bacteria thinner and thinner so eventually you are able to identify these individual colonies and what you've been asked to do is draw a scientific diagram of this so that we can then see your scientific drawing skills so that's what I'm just doing here for my plate the main thing is you need to make sure you don't have any overlapping lines, sketching, colouring in. You need to label it and make sure your label lines don't overlap either. So there we go. You can see my scientific diagram there um, and just zoomed in again. So that was my plate and here is my scientific drawing. So make sure you've got a title, you've got your labels and you haven't got any overlaps, gaps or shading. It's just to show general position, shape and proportions. So that's the results analysis for the streak plate. And on my one, you can see there's no contaminations. A contamination would either be if it's a fungus, you might have a furry part growing. If it's another bacteria, then it'll be a different colour compared to this pale yellow, which E. coli is. So if you have a much more vibrant yellow dot or an orange dot anywhere on your plate, unfortunately that is a contamination and you'll need to label that on your scientific drawing um, to identify that you were aware that there is a contamination. The next part would be the inhibition zone. So for this one, you will need to measure the diameter of any inhibition zones you have. Now to make that easier, I suggest drawing around in a permanent marker. If you've not done that already, maybe have your picture up and um, then create a circle shape on the computer and put that around it, see if that helps. So you need to know the diameter of your inhibition zones. I've included this one here as well, because you can see it much clearer than on my one. So you can really, really see on this one clear inhibition zones. Now there are overlaps, so I would be measuring the diameter up to this point and then all the way around that one. So if you didn't get a chance to measure yours and share the data, not to worry, you can use this set just here. We've got seven pairs, they each plated four antibiotics and they've then put their result for their four. 
So we have ranging from two results up to five results for different antibiotics. From that, you should then be able to highlight which results for each antibiotic do you think are anomalies, if any at all. And then you'd need to discard them before you calculated the mean and the standard deviation. So I've picked out that these three definitely don't fit the pattern. So zero, zero, and zero, so I've removed those. Now you need to be able to calculate the mean and the standard deviation. So I'm not going to put those results in. Um, to help you with your analysis of standard deviation, I'll just link a video up here that you can watch. Um, but for my particular year 12s, to calculate the standard deviations, I've um, sent you some guidelines on showing my homework for how to do that. So you'll just need to follow it. So you should end up with a graph a bit like this. We've got mean diameter and I've put the standard deviations on. Um, so from this, we then need to come up with a conclusion. And what we can see is, it's easier for you to do this with a ruler, but you need to look, do any of the standard deviations overlap? And I can see that these two definitely do, and those two do with this one, so those three overlap. Um, even these four overlap, and I think these five just about overlap as well. Now you'll need to get your ruler definitely to check, does this standard deviation overlap? And I think it might only overlap with a few of them. The main thing though is STR was the antibiotic which had the largest inhibition zone. And even with the standard deviation bar on, there is no overlap with any of the other antibiotics. So what that means is our conclusion would be STR is the most effective antibiotic at treating E. coli. The reason being that we um, can see it had the biggest inhibition zone and therefore it killed the most bacteria. That then links to adding your explanation. So the mean was the highest, so it killed the most bacteria and the standard deviation bars didn't overlap with any others. And that's suggesting it is a significant difference. Therefore, it is significantly more effective. Is the evaluation. And by this, what we mean is you've got the conclusion now that STR is the most effective antibiotic for treating or killing E. coli, but you need to consider, are there any parts of your method that make you doubt that? And for me, there were four key parts of the method. Number one, we only tested eight antibiotics. So therefore, you can't confidently say STR is the most effective for killing E. coli when you've only tested eight. Number two, we need more repeats to identify the anomalies. Because though I picked out three that seemed pretty obvious, there were still a couple in there that you might have been debating. Is it an anomaly or is it not? And the reason it was hard to tell was there was still not enough repeats to be able to see a clear pattern, particularly for one of the antibiotics when there were only two results. Um, it was only tested on one bacteria. Now, if we are concluding it is the most effective for E. coli, that doesn't actually matter. Um, but if we're trying to conclude it is the most effective antibiotic in general, then you'd need to test it on a range of bacteria. Final thing, if we're going to conclude it's the most effective antibiotic at treating E. coli for humans, then we need to know what the side effects are. Because if it actually causes severe vomiting or headaches, um, then maybe it's not going to be the best choice. So those are some of the considerations. Now in yours, you might need to consider as well any issues about you implementing the method. Particularly if you've got a contamination, this is the part where you need to reflect where do you think it was that you weren't completely aseptic and how could you improve that? So that is it for the required practical and aseptic technique. I hope that's helped you to write that up. Give it a thumbs up if it has and subscribe to keep up to date on all the videos I'm going to keep releasing during this self-isolation period.